Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas and welcome back to another episode of Great Men Taking Over the World. Hey guys, Bren here. With the Christmas season here upon us, I always get nostalgic, you know. I have so many awesome memories of uh, gaming and Christmas time, and especially with this bad boy right here, the Sega Dreamcast. I got it for Christmas of 2000 with Sonic Adventure, and I love the system since then. You know, I don't have like the biggest collection for it or played all the games, but the ones that I did play, I freaking love them. So I just wanted to share them here with you today, guys. So without further ado, let's jump right into it and talk about my top 10 favorite Sega Dreamcast games of all time. Let's get sweaty! My number 10 spot goes to the zany fighting game, Power Stone. When I first got my Dreamcast, this game was included on a demo disc that came with the system. The game instantly charmed me with its colorful cast of characters, fun, upbeat music, and awesome unique gameplay where you go head to head with an opponent in various locations and play from an isometric perspective. You do combos and run around the stage doing environmental attacks while finding lots of weapons to use against your opponent. Hell, you can even use Goku's power pole here. The main draw though is to collect power stones. The first one to get all three transforms into a super version and can unleash devastating flashy super attacks. See, you can imagine how crazy it gets as both of you scramble around the stage throwing stuff at each other, stealing each other's power stones, all while trying to nab the last one and then unleash all hell. The transformations and moves were epic. British pilot dude turning into a rocket knight shooting missiles everywhere. A Japanese ronin turning into a silver samurai shooting blades. Essentially a Super Saiyan Goku ripoff doing a spirit bomb move and many others. Even single player was fun and I really enjoyed unlocking the delightful ending cinematics. My buddy Jared got it for me for my birthday back in the day and I had a party that night to celebrate and we played this a ton. So much fun and some great memories. This game can be comparable as a Dreamcast version of Super Smash Bros. There's even a sequel to this which unfortunately I haven't played yet but in this one you can do up to 4 players in it. That sounds totally insane. I'll have to try that sometime. But yeah, the first game is a Dreamcast and Capcom fighting game classic for sure. Wow. Come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! Yeah, 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 yeah. My number 9 spot goes to the insane arcade driving game, Crazy Taxi! Come on, everyone who has a Dreamcast has this game, or at the very least has played it. And rightfully so, this addictive game has you driving around picking up passengers to take them to their chosen destinations. Sounds normal and innocent enough, right? Wrong! You have to go as fast as possible, dodging cars and incoming traffic, jumping off ramps, flying all over the place and cutting and drifting corners like a madman. The faster you get to the destination, the more pleased the customer is, and therefore you get more money and a higher score. So you're encouraged to put the pedal to the metal. You get extra tip money from squeezing past cars and obstacles, so be sure to maximize that too. If you're too slow, the customer gets pissed and even jumps out of your car. Jeez, these people are freaking suicidal. All because they can't get to KFC or Pizza Hut fast enough? Sheesh. Oh yeah, there are real life branded locations in this game too, which is pretty cool. And of course, you can't mention Crazy Taxi without talking about the awesome soundtrack featuring Bad Religion and The Offspring. There are only a few tracks here, but they're super memorable and get you totally hyped to burn rubber and tear up the streets. An incredibly unique game and very iconic to the Dreamcast. Time to make some crazy money! Make a <laughs> the House of the Dead my number 8 spot goes to the classic on-rail light gun shooter, The House of the Dead 2. I saw this game in the arcades and was immediately pulled in because of the incredible graphics, awesome enemy designs, art direction, and intense gore. Plus, it was just a blast to play. I would even try to convince my parents to go to the movie theater to watch a movie, just to have the chance to play this in the theater arcade. Like Power Stone, this game was included on a demo disc that came with the Dreamcast, and I remember just playing that for hours alone, before even touching my actual copy of Sonic Adventure that I got with my system. My buddy Dan ended up getting me the game for my birthday, and soon after, ooh, I was in heaven. 
Like I said, the first thing I loved was the creepy zombie and monster designs, and of course, blasting them all to hell was even better. The gore and bullet damage was so awesome at the time, and still is. You could blast holes into these freaks' heads, blast half of their heads off, blow their whole head off, and annihilate their entire upper bodies. I thought this was so over the top, detailed, and crazy. I couldn't help but love it. The Italian based cities made for cool atmospheric locations. The music was bopping, and it was cool being able to go through multiple pathways in each level for replayability. I don't want to die. My God. The voice acting. Oh God, the voice acting. It's utterly abysmal, but God damn, is it hilarious as hell. <laughs> people of the AMS. I am Goldman. I don't care if you people try to get in my way or not. In time, you'll find out who's right. <laughs> this is a present from me to you. So iconic to this game. What's weird though is I never actually got the light gun for this game and just played it with the Dreamcast controller. And I still had a blast. I guess I just wanted to shoot up some zombies regardless of how I played it, you know? <laughs> typing of the Dead is its own separate Dreamcast game too, where you can practice your typing skills to shoot enemies instead of using a gun. I never played it, but that actually looks pretty interesting. The guys even run around with keyboards attached to them instead of guns. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Anyway, The House of the Dead 2 is my all-time favorite on rail shooter. Hell yeah. Resident Evil. My number seven spot goes to the survival horror classic Resident Evil Code Veronica. Me being a Resident Evil fan coming from the PS1 era, it was a no-brainer getting Code Veronica once I got a Dreamcast. My mom got the game for me for my birthday, soon after Christmas, which is when I got the actual system itself. The main character this time around is Claire Redfield from Resident Evil 2. She gets captured while infiltrating an umbrella facility and is thrown on a prison island, and you guessed it, an outbreak happens there. She teams up with another inmate, Steve Burnside, to get the hell off the island and also to find her brother, Chris. This game really showcased the power of the Dreamcast when it came out. The graphics were amazing and seemed so realistic compared to the blocky PS1 games we were used to. This was the first time the series didn't use pre-rendered backgrounds as they were all fully 3D here, and it was cool to see dynamic lighting affect the surroundings as well as the camera not always being completely static and it would track you in a cinematic fashion. The characters during cutscenes were incredibly detailed and animated. You could actually see facial expressions and their mouths would move as they talk rather than how they would just, you know, swing their arms around wildly like the older games. What a step up! Of course, with the new engine, all the monsters look more detailed and grotesque than ever before here. Watch out for them damn bandersnatches! <laughs> I also like cool additions like being able to aim at separate enemies with dual wielding weapons. This is another solid entry in the traditional style of Resident Evil games, and at the time, it felt super next gen. I really hope Capcom remakes this one next. Jet Rhino Radio! My number six spot goes to the super stylized, hip and funky action game, Jet Grind Radio! Also referred to as Jet Set Radio, but was called Jet Grind Radio in the North American release. Me and some of the other great men already made an in-depth review of this game several years ago. Go check it out after this video. It's one of my personal favorite reviews we've done, and it has some pretty ridiculous shit in it. Go check it out. Taking place in a rendition of Tokyo, Japan, you play as an up-and-coming gang roaming the streets, riding jet-powered inline skates, listening to wild tunes as you claim your territory by spray-painting graffiti all over the place, all the while trying to dominate rival gangs and avoiding the police in the process. The first thing you'll notice is the extremely vibrant associated graphics, which were very unique and new at the time. That, combined with the ridiculously badass soundtrack featuring original music, as well as some well-known artists, you can't help but get sucked into the experience. This game oozes creativity, style, and personality. It just makes you want to jump up and dance around. There's certainly some influence of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater as you ride around, grind rails, and do aerial tricks for points. But on top of that, you have to find places to tag your graffiti in which you do these quick timer event style button prompts to make some sweet looking pieces of art. You have to do all this within a time limit and the cops will send out dogs, riot forces, and even helicopters and tanks that shoot missiles at you. This game is insane and just totally Japanese. 
unlocking characters to add to your ever-growing gang was fun, and you can even make your own graffiti to use in the game. Ooh, I absolutely love the atmosphere in this game. Grinding, spray painting, listening to awesome beats and neon lit cityscapes is so memorable and nostalgic to me. The sequel, Jet Set Radio Future, released on the original Xbox, that game was freaking awesome too. Arguably even better. I really hope Sega brings this series back. We need it. Jet Set Radio! That's right. My number 5 spot goes to the high speed platforming classic, Sonic Adventure. This was the reason to own a Dreamcast back in the day. I remember playing this at in-store kiosks and being absolutely blown away by the graphics and speed of the game. Talk about a next-gen showcase right here. This was the first fully realized 3D Sonic game, the one all of us classic Sonic fans wanted ever since we saw what the N64 did with Super Mario 64 for that franchise. Blazing through beautiful and fun stages as the blue blur at dizzying speeds to which I haven't seen in a 3D game up to that point was insane. I can't stress that enough. Sonic was back, baby. Ooh, was he back. Running through sunny beaches, going through loop-de-loops, getting chased by a giant killer whale. Everyone who's played this game remembers these iconic moments, as well as other awesome parts like getting sucked into a tornado, then making your way down to race down an epic track in the sky and running straight down a cliffside. Or how about snowboarding down a mountain to escape an incoming avalanche, and many other memorable experiences. You even get to play as Super Sonic in an epic showdown at the end. Adventure is in the title, so the game has these mini hub worlds like Station Square and the Mystic Ruins to connect action stages together, making it feel like a more realized world, which is pretty cool. Who can forget the laid-back jamming guitar riff at Station Square? Did I mention the music in this game is awesome? Well, it is. Not only do you play as Sonic, you get to play as several other characters from the universe as well, including his best pal Tails who flies around and races against Sonic. There's also Knuckles who can glide and digs for Chaos Emeralds in a scavenger hunt style gameplay. Then there's Amy Rose who has always had a crush on Sonic. In her stages you run away from a robot or something, it's, it's kinda lame. Then there's Big the Cat who fishes for his friend Froggy. Wait, why the hell is fishing in a Sonic game? Pretty random. Then there's also E102 Gamma, a robot that does shooter style stages. The variety is cool and all, but come on, we're here to play as Sonic. I just wanna be Sonic. There's also the Chow Garden, where you raise these cute little fuckers to compete in races. I never really did this much here, much more so in Sonic Adventure 2. I got this game for Christmas with my Dreamcast back in 2000, and after playing the House of the Dead 2 demo for hours, I jumped on this and played it all night. But I couldn't save because I didn't have a memory card. Later that same Christmas day, I brought it over to a friend's house to start it all over. You know, we got pretty far and all, but I still wasn't able to save. Then I finally got a memory card the following day after that, when, you know, stores were open again, and I had to start the game all over again, which I gladly did because this game was so awesome. My number 4 spot goes to the amazing weapons-based fighting game, Soul Calibur. I played Soul Blade on PS1 with my brother. I thought it was cool and all, but I never got into it like he did. Then, when the sequel came out for the Dreamcast, I remember it was all the rage. I played it at in-store kiosks a few times before I had the system myself and thought it looked and played good and all, but I was more focused on the hot babes more than anything else. <laughs> I mean, could you blame me? <laughs> So even then, I still wasn't that into the game. It wasn't until I got a Dreamcast, rented the game, and spent some quality time with it that I eventually see how awesome it was. The cinematic intro sucked me right in. The graphics in general were amazing. Character models looked spectacular, as well as the gorgeous backgrounds accompanied by very grand and epic music to hype up the fight. The fighting mechanics felt like no other game at the time. It was so smooth, fluid, and flashy. The 8-way run system, you know, how you move around, really solidified the feel of a true three-dimensional fighting arena. There were so many different characters with their own unique weapons and fighting styles that have now become iconic to the series. Yes, even everyone's favorite BDSM freak, Valdo. The grab moves you do on your opponents were so freaking cool looking, and the animation in the game in general was absolutely stunning at the time. I remember having a blast playing arcade mode, unlocking characters, playing mission battle mode, where you were put into unique scenarios such as enemies regenerating health, sinking into the ground, and various other crazy situations. I was really impressed with the game and everything it had to offer, so soon after renting it, you know I had to go out and buy it. And the rest is history. Welcome back to the stage of history.
so all that is not even including the amazing times I had playing with friends as well. I brought my buddies from school over to my house and we'd have epic tournaments. Then much later on I'd bring my Dreamcast over to my friend Lindsay's house and play regularly with him, his brother, and his friend. I would always kick ass with my favorites Siegfried and Huang, pulverizing and ringing out my opponents relentlessly. Ah, good times. We'd also compete to see who could get the highest score in the super addicting survival and extra survival modes. This game had so many cool modes. You could do team battle and fight a match of up to 8 against 8 and see how many of your opponent's characters you could destroy without losing a single one of yours. There's an exhibition theater where you can watch a cool choreographed display of moves from each character. The museum, unlocking and sifting through those beautiful works of art while being mesmerized by that wonderful music. Man, that music. Hearing that now, I tell ya, it brings back some great memories and really pulls at those nostalgic heartstrings. Uh. Soul Calibur still holds up incredibly well, more than 20 years later, and the core of the game is still more or less unchanged, even up to the latest installment, Soul Calibur 6, which is certainly a testament to the perfection of the fighting system and the mechanics established here. This blew away all other fighting games at the time in my opinion. Soul Calibur is easily my favorite fighting game on the Dreamcast and one of the best games ever made. This game is a work of art. The legend will never die. My number 3 spot goes to the speedy platforming sequel, Sonic Adventure 2. As you know, I loved Sonic Adventure, so of course I was extremely hyped about this game ever since it was announced. I got it in June 2001, just as the school year was ending, which was awesome because I got to play it uninterrupted all summer long, baby, oh yeah. The game immediately hooked me. The graphics and animation were much better than the first one, as you could tell during gameplay and in the cool ass cutscenes too. It looked much smoother, running in 60 FPS this time around. As soon as that first level with Sonic fired up, dude, I knew I was in for one hell of a ride. The now iconic City Escape stage has Sonic streetboarding down these San Francisco-esque hills, jumping off ramps, doing spins and shit, holy mackerel! Then you're jumping and bouncing all over the place and doing rail grinding, which was new to the series at this point. You're running down the side of a building, then getting chased by a giant truck. All this with the cheesy yet freaking awesome song, Escape from the City, blasting in the background. Woo, yeah! yeah. This level is amazing and perfectly encompasses the speed and awesomeness of Sonic Adventure 2. This shit is hype baby, what a start! And the rest of the Sonic levels were so much freaking fun to play too. Lots of diverse locations and everything. Metal Harbor, the jungle, the Egyptian stage, grinding in outer space, you name it. Haha, <laughs> oh yeah! So instead of choosing characters individually like Sonic Adventure 1, this time around you choose whether to play as the hero or dark side storylines. Hero has Sonic leading the forefront obviously, but then you also switch between Knuckles and Tails as well. The dark side are basically the bad guys featuring newcomer Shadow the Hedgehog, who everyone keeps mistaking as Sonic, which gets Sonic in a lot of trouble throughout the game. Treasure Hunter Rouge the Bat, who will make furry fans dreams come true. <laughs> and for the first time you could finally play as the main Sonic villain himself, Dr. Robotnik aka Eggman. The hero and dark side storylines intersect and show the different sides of what's been going on, but gameplay wise, they are essentially a mirror of each other. Like Sonic and Shadow have the same style of speedy platforming action stages, which of course are the most fun to play by far. Knuckles and Rouge have the same style of Master Emerald peace hunting, just like Sonic Adventure 1, although they do feel better and more fun to play here than the first game. Tails and Robotnik also share the same gameplay style of controlling a mech, targeting, shooting, and platforming as you traverse the environments. Very much like E-102 Gamma's levels in Sonic Adventure 1. It totally makes sense for Robotnik to be in some sort of mech, but I'm not sure why Tails is. I know he's a mechanical genius and all, but come on, Tails is supposed to be able to fly around using his tails. I mean, come on, his name is Tails, what the hell? <laughs> 
Seriously though, I had a blast with all these characters. Even though Adventure is in the title, this time they took out the hub areas that connected stages like they were in the first game. Honestly, it didn't really bother me. The game was so good with or without hub areas, I barely noticed. Trust me, there was plenty of adventure here for me to enjoy. And of course, just like the first game, the music here is also fan-freaking-tastic. I've already mentioned the glorious City Escape track, but pretty much all of Sonic stages have a really cool, rocking, melodic, fast-paced guitar soundtrack, perfectly suited for the high-octane action. Tails and Robotnik also have some dope guitar tunes for their stages as well. Rouge has some glitzy, funky, jazzy-sounding music in her stages, which is nice. And yo, Knuckles has some dope-ass hip-hop tunes for his stages. I mean, dude, Pumpkin Hill is awesome. That level is creepy and atmospheric as hell. Flying around the bottomless canyon towards the jack-o'-lantern mountain spires, looking for emerald pieces while these badass beats are playing to set the mood? Hell yeah! I gotta bump this one every Halloween season, at least once. <laughs> Chow Garden? My god, the Chow Garden. Remember how I said I barely played this in Sonic Adventure 1? Well, I played the ever-freaking hell out of it here. It's like a game within a game, like a Tamagotchi sort of pet raising simulator, except much more in depth. During the action stages, you collect little animals and chaos drives from the robots you destroy, which you then give to the Chow and those will affect their attributes and appearance based on what you give them. Like you can give them a cheetah to increase running speed, or a penguin to increase swimming speed, and so on. So you can get some really different and cool looking Chow. But it's not just appearance, like I said their attributes are affected, in which you can enter them into races and win some pretty cool prizes. You can get toys and it was fun seeing them interact with those within the garden. They were so freaking adorable, and it was so sad when they died but at least they were reborn into new chow. You could save them to your VMU memory card and do some minigame stuff there as well. They'd also be affected by which character you were using to raise them, so either hero or dark dictated whether they'd evolve into a light or a dark based chow. And this was the only place you could run around as Robotnik freely. Woo! Haha! <laughs> Look at Robotnik run around! Look at him go! Wee! Haha! <laughs> there was so much to do here and so many ways to raise your chow. I spent so many hours here alone. Like I said, a game within a game. So much replay value. I absolutely loved it. Man, I could say so much about Sonic Adventure 2 and how special of a game it is to me. I remember painstakingly earning an A score on every level with every character, winning all the Chow races and earning all 180 emblems, and playing over 130 hours on one save file. I don't know if anyone remembers Pepsi Twist, but that stuff was in stores around the time this game was out, and I remember drinking some ice cold Pepsi Twist, eating 3D jalapeno Doritos and playing this incredible game late into the summer nights, and into the mornings too. <laughs> My brother even remembers passing by the living room where I was playing it constantly, and even to this day he says he remembers always hearing the Chow Garden music that summer. That damn Chow Garden music always playing. <laughs> So while this game doesn't hold up as well as something like Soul Calibur, playing it at the time was so enjoyable. To me, it was absolutely perfect. I loved every minute of it. This was one of the best games of my childhood and the memories it gave me of that summer of 2001, I will not easily forget. My number two spot goes to the legendary epic martial arts adventure game, Shenmue. Oh boy, Shenmue. Dude, I love this game so much. Like, I know it's not for everyone, and nor do a lot of the gameplay elements hold up today, but I always come back to this charming game, almost every December around Christmas time, because I absolutely love the story, characters, music, and especially the atmosphere. Me and the other great men already did an epic two-part episode of this incredible game. We go into detail of memories and the impact it made on us at the time. It's quite a nostalgic throwback, and it's packed with some pretty funny shit in it too. Go check those out if you haven't yet when you're done with this video. Trust me, you're gonna love them. Links down below. This is an old school martial arts tale of revenge. Well, at least initially. Taking place in 80s Japan, the main character, Ryo Hazuki, arrives home one cold November day to witness the brutal murder of his father by a stone-cold Chinese martial artist, Lan Di. 
who also steals a mysterious dragon mirror from Ryo's dad before killing him. After taking quite the beating himself and recovering days later, he embarks on a quest to find Landi to seek vengeance, figure out why his father was killed in the first place, and to unravel the mystery of the dragon and phoenix mirrors. The main quest is essentially a detective game where you're talking to people around town, finding clues and leads all in the attempt to trying to find Landi. So because of that, you'll meet a lot of interesting and weird characters as you progress. The voice acting and dialogue is absolutely terrible and can be very awkward, but has become so iconic to this game that I wouldn't want it any other way. It's so fucking funny and charming, I love it. Of course, don't forget to ask where sailors hang out. Do you know a place where sailors hang out? Um, I heard there's a bar where sailors hang out, but I don't know the place because I've never wanted to go to such a bar, you know? I see. I've never seen anything like Shenmue when it came out. It was incredibly creative, ambitious, and really pushed the gaming landscape. It was super cinematic. The cutscenes were like a straight up movie. It had unbelievable graphical fidelity from character faces, animation, to environments, lighting, everything. Like it really showcased the power of the Dreamcast at the time. Truly next gen shit right here. Visually, this game still holds up pretty damn well for being over 20 years old, I must say. Besides the insane visuals, there was an unseen level of attention to detail. This was one of the first open world games. You can go wherever you wanted and do whatever you wanted, or at least that's what it felt like at the time, because of that level of detail and freedom. You could open and search into individual drawers and cabinets in your house, pick up and inspect random trinkets and whatnot. It was so cool. I see so many modern games doing this now, and I believe Shenmue might have been the first one to do it this way. You make phone calls where you actually have to dial each number manually on an old school rotary phone. This game actually taught me how to use rotary phones. <laughs> The weather system was dynamic and would change from day to day. You could even set the weather to match that of the real life location of Yokosuka and its weather of that time frame. This shit was crazy. Each NPC was their own unique character with a distinct name, face, and backstory. They'd walk around town doing their own thing according to their own schedule. The town shops were realistic in the sense that they had their own hours of operation. So sometimes you'd have to come back to the shop the next day if it was closed, or you'd have to wait for appointments with NPCs at a certain time on a certain day. It was insanely methodical and realistic. So since you'd have to wait for appointments sometimes, you'd have to find ways to spend your time in between. You could spend money at the capsule machines and have fun collecting all the different little figurines like Sonic and other Sega characters, cool off and drink some cola at a vending machine, very much like real life Japan. There are vending machines everywhere. Ah, good. You could train your in-depth list of martial arts moves to strengthen your technique. You could wander the streets, go into the different shops and talk with people to enjoy the ridiculous conversations. I use quality beef and buns. My pickles are homemade, you know. I see. Take care of the cute little neighborhood kitty cat. Meow. Go to the convenience store which had some banging music and shop for some goods, collecting music tapes and playing to win raffle prizes. And of course, you could go to the local arcade and play darts, hang on, space carrier, or the QTE practice machines. Oh yeah, QTE quick timer events were still pretty new at the time, and Shenmue integrated them so well. So sometimes they'd randomly pop up when you're just exploring, or other times they're part of an intense action sequence where Ryo lays the royal smackdown on some thugs. The QTE sequences are so awesome and cinematic, I freaking love them. <laughs> Besides kicking ass with random time button prompts, there are Virtua Fighter 3D Arena fight sequences where Ryo has to take on multiple foes at once. Dude, the move list and all the different attacks you could do was crazy. Doing flying tornado spin kicks to dudes' heads and grabbing and tossing them around the place and into each other. <laughs> so much fun. NPCs would teach you new moves and you could see Ryo growing not just as a martial artist, but as a person with a deep respect for this lifestyle. Don't forget about getting a full-time forklift job later on in the game. It becomes a forklift simulator. <laughs> Damn, this game was crazy. I love just wandering around the environments of Yamanose, Sakuragaoka, Doboita, and the harbor, going into all the unique little cozy shops where they'd all have their own distinct vibe and music playing. Like that's another thing, each little shop was super distinct, and they made the effort to have them have their own soundtrack for each place. So much detail to make this world feel special. Why do you 
want to know about other Chinese? Man, the music is godlike. From the sweeping cinematic orchestral main theme, to the fun little melodies of random shops, and the extremely relaxing and chill background music of just exploring the streets really sets the mood and atmosphere to Shenmue. This game has one of the best and most unique atmospheres in a game I've ever experienced. It's just so Shenmue. It's so warm, cozy, and nostalgic. It's like comfort food in video game form. Especially when it's snowing in the game and dusk falls, there's a warm glow to it all. Those relaxing tracks and the vibe of the game in general is therapeutic and zen-like to me. In real life, when there's the first snowfall of the season, I love walking outside, watching the snow, feeling the cold, and listening to some Shenmue tracks. Then I'd come home to some hot cocoa, more Shenmue music, and just relax. Ah, that's the Shenmue vibe right there, baby. Oh yeah. I actually went to Japan several years ago and visited the Shenmue location of Yokosuka and Dobuita Street in real life. I even asked an old man if he knew where sailors hang out in English, but he didn't understand me so to make it less awkward, I just asked him where Dobuita Street was. <laughs> Dude, wandering Dobuita Street and the neighborhood around it while I listened to Shenmue music was fucking magical. That whole Japan trip was amazing and going to Dobuita Street towards the end solidified it as one of the best experiences of my life. Shenmue, it's more than a game. It's an incredibly immersive experience. It's a peek into life in Japan and its culture in the 80s. Even to this day, there's nothing quite like it, and some of the attention to detail is still unrivaled. Like I said, it's not for everyone. Unfortunately, many people find it frustrating and incredibly boring. But for those of us it does resonate with, it's truly something special. Before I reveal my favorite Sega Dreamcast game of all time, here are a few honorable mentions. My favorite Sega Dreamcast game of all time is the epic masterpiece, Shenmue 2. Another Shenmue game, you say? Well, duh, didn't you just see how much I raved about the first game? This should be no surprise. <laughs> I didn't even know Shenmue 2 was out at the time because I heard the Dreamcast version got cancelled in the States. But in early 2002, my brother found the imported European copy at our local game shop as I was looking around at games to get for my birthday present. This was a total surprise to me, that it was something that was available and that I could even have in my own possession. So of course I had to get it as my birthday gift immediately. This was destiny, baby. I also needed to get a special disc to be able to read imports, and I got it just for Shenmue 2. Since I got the European version, it only had Japanese voice acting with English subtitles, which I actually found more appropriate even though I still love the goofy voice acting from Shenmue 1. As soon as I fired it up, I knew it was going to be an epic adventure. It was so weird to see the game continue from where it left off at the end of Shenmue 1, with Ryo Hazuki riding a big boat to Hong Kong, hot on the trail of Lan Di. Ryo arrives in the bustling city, there's so much going on here. Obviously it's a bit overwhelming, giving the sense that Ryo ain't in Kansas anymore, leaving the familiarity of the quaint neighborhood of his hometown in Japan, and is now in the foreign lands of China with mystery and trouble lurking afoot. That's what I immediately loved about Shenmue 2. It was a huge contrast to Shenmue 1. It felt like a massive adventure. Shenmue 1 was smaller in scale and felt cozy. Shenmue 2 opened up and felt grand and epic. It really expanded on what the first game established. It was a lengthier game too, four discs long compared to the three of Shenmue 1. There were more places to go, more characters to meet, more mini-games to play. 
arm wrestle for money. You can even race ducks for some reason. <laughs> you can now sell figures from capsule toy machines to pawn shops, which is great for when you keep getting doubles. Lots and lots of gambling. Part-time jobs like carrying boxes and working for lucky hit stands. So making money was much easier and you had more options of doing so. If you had appointments or had to wait for a particular store to open, you could skip time if you didn't want to wait around. NPCs would actually help you a lot more than Shenmue 1, even walking you over to places that you're looking for. There was a ton more fighting, especially when you get to Kowloon on disc 3, and I really like the new style pause screen memory based QTE sequences. The game felt even more cinematic. Shenmue 1 had some cool camera shots and cinematography, but this game felt next level with the epic shots and vistas. It really drew me into the story and the world. Like I said, you meet cool, new memorable characters like the little kid Wong, who lives on the streets and robs Ryo in the beginning of the game, only to become his friend later on. Joy, the hot biker chick who definitely seems to have a thing for Ryo. She helps him get a job and helps him with intel and such. It would be nice if Ryo could help her out too, if you know what I mean. Hoo <laughs> There's Xu Ying, the master of Manmo Temple who makes Ryo venture out and learn about the virtues of Kung Fu. She's a really cool yet troubled character. Plus, she's a total babe, so that's cool too, you know? <laughs> you meet plenty of other Kung Fu masters, each parting great wisdom of martial arts with Ryo. And then of course there's good old Ren of Heavens, leader of a street gang who ends up teaming up with Ryo because he's always on the lookout for an opportunity when he thinks there's money involved. Ren is hilarious and seeing him and Ryo quarrel as they work together is a lot of fun. I guess I thought Ren was such a cool character at the time that I decided to use that name for all my gamer tags since then. And guess what? That name is still around even today. Even on this show. Whoa! Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Woo! Dude, there are so many great parts in this game, like escaping capture while handcuffed with Ren, darting around the hallways, doing QTE, then making an epic jump across the building to escape the boss of the Yellowhead organization, that big dumb looking motherfucker down you. And the epicness of going up the Yellowhead building, beating up so many goons in suits along the way, then fighting down you in an epic showdown on the rooftop as Lan Di watches from a helicopter and the sun sets over the city. Holy shit dude, this was so tight. I remember thinking the game was about to be over, but then realized there was a whole nother disc after this part. That blew my mind. After all that city hustle and bustle, you go to the remote rural areas of Guilin and finally meet the girl in Ryo's dreams from Shenmue 1, Shenhua. Walking through the beautiful nature trails of the forest and mountains while getting to know each other and listening to all that gorgeous music was such a wonderful time. It felt so different and relaxing from everything you've experienced so far. It was such a nice contrast and come down after the hype of Kowloon. Those were some of the best parts of the game for me honestly. Just strolling around and talking. What a vibe. Speaking of gorgeous music, dude, Shenmue fires away on all cylinders yet again. Even more godlike music this time around. The bumping, badass theme of Wise Man's Quarter makes you want to get up and train in real life. I love how the different areas have different music for the day and night themes. Green Market Quarter at night, hell yeah. Oh, dude, the music that plays when Ryo wakes up on Wong's boat, the morning of the fog's wave. Holy shit, that's incredible. Listening to it right now as I'm writing this, it's making me tear up because it's so beautiful and filled with nostalgia. This right here, this is Shenmue. This is art. Meeting all the characters, seeing the story develop and the places you travel to was incredible. I was so invested in the narrative and learning more about the dragon and phoenix mirrors. And you finally find out what Shenmue means. Of course the insane ending cliffhanger was so epic and had us all on the edge of our seats, which was such a shame because for the longest time, we didn't know if we'd ever get a Shenmue 3. The sequel was cancelled with the sales of the two games not meeting expectations, which was so goddamn heartbreaking. 
All of us Shenmue fans were stuck in that cave with Ryo and Shenhua for 13 long years until they finally announced Shenmue 3. And man, we couldn't believe our eyes and ears when we saw that was happening. But that's another story for another day. But yeah, man, that was the greatest yet most brutal cliffhanger I've ever seen in a video game. What a crazy time. Over the years, I've come to appreciate Shenmue 1 a lot more, and even now, it's hard to choose one over the other. Shenmue 1's cozy atmosphere is so different and seductive. I'd love to revisit it, especially as a festive Christmas tradition, but I also usually end up playing Shenmue 2 right after as well, cause, well, that's just what you gotta do, right? <laughs> Shenmue 2 loses that sense of dense detail and coziness of Shenmue 1, but gains an immense sense of adventure. It feels like you're traveling, experiencing, and absorbing the culture and history of China by learning martial arts from several masters you encounter, learning not just moves and techniques, but philosophies of life, and becoming a better person in the process. It's so cool to see Ryo grow throughout this game. This may have been the first game where I truly got a sense of epicness from its scope, like a massive quest. Beating the game the first time back in 2002, the credits began, and I looked back at the journey I just went through. Hong Kong, Kowloon, Guilin, man what a moment. After watching the credits roll and listening to the music play, I turned off the Dreamcast, I went outside in real life, sat on my porch and just enjoyed the sunshine and the nice spring breeze, thinking about what an awesome experience that was. That was the first time a game made me reflect and appreciate it so much afterwards. I also got many friends into the game when we were younger, and it was a joy to watch them get entranced by the magic of Shenmue. I could go on and on about Shenmue 1 and 2, comparing the two and even discussing Shenmue 3, the future of the franchise, and beyond. But for now, I'll simply leave it at this. Shenmue 2 is a true swan song to the legendary Sega Dreamcast. It's my favorite game on the system, and my favorite game of all time. And thus, the saga begins. So guys, thanks for joining me on another episode. This time I took a look at my top 10 favorite Sega Dreamcast games of all time. I absolutely love these games. And you know, there's still so many games I still have to play for this system. Uh, so many classics, you know, Fantasy Star Online, Skies of Arcadia, I want to try crazy zany stuff like Seaman, Space Channel 5, you know, Samba Di Amigo with the, with the maracas and all that stuff. <laughs> There's still there's so much variety. That's what's so cool about the Dreamcast. It was so innovative, and it's just it's a damn shame that you know it only lasted for like two years. I really wish it lasted longer, but hey, it is what it is. It's bittersweet, and it's still just a fantastic system. And it's always fun to go back to. So you guys, let me know what you think of my picks in the comments below, as well as what you would pick for your favorite Dreamcast games. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear what other kind of games are out there, especially that I might not even have heard of would be awesome so let me know be sure to like and share the video i would greatly appreciate that as well as subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and yeah guys that's pretty much it so happy holidays and until the next episode guys merry christmas and happy new year ho 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 <coughs> oh, <damn. coughs> oh, that's for real oh.